Let's talk about the tiny gap between the monumental difference of the good and the evil. Welcome to Coffee with Creamer, where you get to sit down with our host, Dr. Barry Creamer, for a conversation about faith, life, and culture. We'll look at old ideas through a new lens, turn those culture wars on their head, and paint a picture of the way things could be. If you like your thinking deep and your coffee hot, pull up a chair. You're in the right place. In Luke's gospel, in the 22nd chapter, there is this story about the end, the last supper that they take together, the end of Jesus' ministry before his crucifixion. And uh, it it is a passage that relates both the contrast between evil and good in such a clear way and the similarity between those who are evil and those who are good in just as clear a way. Uh, So I want to read through the passage with you and then talk about uh, some of those, and these are obvious in the passage itself, some of those distinctions and blurred lines as well. So the passage begins this way, Satan enters into Judas. So this is verse 3 of Luke 22. Then Satan entered into Judas, called Iscariot, who was of the number of the twelve, and he went away and conferred with the chief priests and the officers how he might betray him to them. So Judas is hands down the worst possible disciple. He is filled with Satan. He becomes, in the rest of the New Testament, the Antichrist. He is Satan incarnate among the disciples. So Satan enters into Judas, and Judas goes out to betray them. There can't be anyone we would think of in a worse light. And in verse 5, he goes out after he's gone to the chief priests and the officers, and they, the chief priests and the officers, to whom he's going to betray Jesus, are glad, and they agree to give him money. So he consents, and he sought an opportunity to betray Jesus to them in the absence of the crowd. We know all the reasons that he's going through these uh, machinations, machinations with uh, the uh, chief uh, priests and the officers uh, because they can't take him in public because he's too popular in public. So they need someone uh, to betray Jesus. And all of this is about Judas making preparations to betray Jesus. And it's clear in this little section of the passage that Jesus has enemies and that the enemies he has really are evil. They are doing something terrible to him. And it's not just terrible contextually. It is evil what they're doing. Satan has filled Judas to bring this to pass. And the people who want to kill Jesus are violating the very laws of God they say they embrace when they do it. So they are doing evil. There is a very real evil that's out there, and it's easy to pick out. That's part of what's going on in this story. So if I, if I were to come to you and say, okay, who's the worst disciple of all time? You know, take the 12, who's, who's the worst? There's no question about it. It's Judas. Easy to answer. In Scripture, it's obvious. He's referred to that way. There's no doubt about it whatsoever. If I came to you, And I said, okay, who's the best of the disciples? Uh, You might say, I don't know. You mean morally, you mean whatever. No, 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 no. Who's the greatest disciple? If you take the 12 and you take the whole list and you say, who is the leader among the disciples? Who is the most influential? Who's the star of the show? Who's the one Jesus picks out and says, you take care of everyone else? Who's the greatest disciple? It's not a hard question to answer. It's Peter. You can say, oh, well, there were three that it was really close to, but among the three, who's the chief? It's Peter. There's no question about it. So if we start out saying, let's just make it as obvious as possible. Who's the worst? It's Judas. Who's the best? It's Peter. If we want to contrast people, those are who we're going to contrast among the apostles. So how does it turn out? Among the disciples, that is. How does it turn out? All right, well, first, we have this story about Judas and just how evil he is. But let me read you the rest of the passage, then we'll go back and fill it in with some detail. Starting in verse 7, 
So in verses three through six, we have the betrayal. Judas is preparing to betray Jesus. In verse seven, it says, then the day of the of unleavened bread approaches, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. In verse eight, so Jesus sent Peter and John. He sends Peter and John. So Peter's being set up to be involved in this. Peter and John, go and prepare the Passover for us. And this is all about preparations. So first, Judas is making preparations to betray Jesus. But then Peter, along with John, is making preparations to commune with Jesus, not to betray him, but to commune with Jesus. And Jesus is setting Peter up for this. He's asking him, go and prepare the place where we're going to take the Passover together so that we can eat it. So they said to him, well, where will you have us prepare it? So Peter's going to be preparing it. He said to them, behold, when you've entered into the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you, follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of the house, the teacher has, uh, says to you, where is the guest room where I may enter the pass, uh, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he'll show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. And they went, they found it just as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover. Peter's making preparations to commune with Jesus. So just like I said a moment ago, Jesus, you know, in the passage about Judas, Jesus has enemies. In this case, we know Jesus has friends, not just Peter and John who are preparing to take the Passover with him, but also the man who's in the town who has a room that he can use, and all he needs to hear is, hey, the the master, the teacher, wants uh, to use your room to have the Passover, and he's going to give him a room to have the Passover with his friends. So Jesus has friends just like he has enemies, Judas and the people who want to kill him. And it's obvious in this also that Christianity is easy to identify. It's where you recognize that Jesus is Lord. Judas is not following Jesus well. Peter and John are following Jesus, and so is the man who owns the room. Hey, the teacher has need of him. Do what he says. Christianity is real, and it's defined by Jesus, and it's the fact that Jesus is Lord. This is all really simple. That's where we start out. So there is a real evil, and it's easy to pick out. It's like Judas, and Jesus has enemies. There is also something good here, and that is Jesus has friends, those who follow him, and they recognize his lordship, and they prepare to commune with him, to spend time with him. All right, but it doesn't stop there. The next verse, verse 14, when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. Now, in this case, I'm, I'm going to tell you this before I read it to you, because as I'm reading it, just think about these things. What Jesus now is going to make preparations for is to be betrayed. So Judas is making preparations to betray him, Peter is making preparations so they can commune together. Jesus is making preparations to be betrayed, which is what he's about to communicate. The apostles themselves are beginning to turn on each other. Are you the one? Are you the one? Hey, who's going to be greatest among us? All those kinds of questions. And the point here is going to be, and you'll see this as I read the passage to you, that it's really easy to see what Christianity is about in Jesus where he's laying down his life for the people who are betraying him. But it's not so easy to see Christianity in his followers who are actually denying the very thing he's teaching them to do, humble themselves among each other, sacrifice your life for the others, as they argue among themselves about how this is going to happen. So here's here's where it shows up in the passage, verse 14. So when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him, And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. I'm providing a meal with you before I go and suffer on your behalf, because that's what Christianity is. I'm dying for you. I am giving up. I am am offering a sacrifice on your behalf. For I tell you, he says in verse 16, I will not eat it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took a cup, And when he had given thanks, he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. You get to drink this. And he said, because I tell you from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. He's showing them now in him not partaking. He's saying, here, you take this. This is my blood. You are drinking. You are getting the benefit. But I am sacrificing. I am offering to you the thing that you need. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body. You are consuming it. Now, the, I mean, as beautiful as the image is now that we take the Lord's Supper together, do you realize what a sort of painful image that is he's showing to them? You are tearing me apart. You are the ones for whom I'm dying. 
And in the process, you are consuming me. You are devouring me. It would be horrific if it weren't from the one who loved them so much that he is laying down his life on their behalf so that they can become what he's modeling for them. And so anyway, he says, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And like, and, and even that statement, in remembrance of me, remember what this cost. Remember what this was about, the sacrifice I'm making. Likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you, this is the new covenant in my blood. I'm giving you my blood to drink. You are benefiting. But behold, at this very table to which I am offering the cup to every person, at this very table is the hand of him who betrays me. In verse 22, because the Son of Man is going just as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Someone sitting at this table is going to betray me. And you can say to yourself, oh, well, you know, everybody's going to know it's Judas. He's the bad guy, right? No, the very next verse says, they began to question one another which of them it could be who was going to do this. So in the passage where we've been set up by Luke first to see how clear it is that Judas is the enemy, he's betraying Jesus, and then to see how loyal Jesus' friends are, not just Peter and John who go to prepare the room, but a, but a man who doesn't know they're going to use his room for the Passover and is willing to do it simply because the teacher says, I have need of, of this room. Do you have a place where we could take the Passover together? There's that kind of loyalty to him. The distinctions are so clear and yet with the 12 sitting around a table with Jesus, and Jesus saying, one of you is going to betray me, it is not even clear to the 12 who've been walking with Jesus this whole time. They can't tell who it is. Is it, is it, is it you? Is it I? I don't, it's not me. It's got to be you. It's got to be. They have no idea who it's going to be. So, it is easy to see the Christianity in Jesus. He's laying down his life for people who are consuming it in front of him. It is not so easy to see in us. And this is a big part of what we have to reconsider in our examination of our Christianity, because very often we identify ourselves with Jesus, which obviously we ought to do, but we identify ourselves with Jesus in a way that makes us think that because he is perfect and because his message is perfect, what we have conveyed about it and the way we have demonstrated it is equally authoritative, and that's a problem. In the way Christianity, in the way we ought to understand our Christianity, we should recognize that very often what is so easy to see in Jesus' life, in the Gospels, for instance, is practically invisible in our lives, and we have to be willing to make the adjustments to correct that. Let me illustrate further as I continue to read the story, and actually let me just allow the story to continue the illustration further, because as they're sitting at table with Jesus telling them that he's laying down his life on their behalf, and then they begin to argue among themselves about who it's going to be that will betray him, as they continue arguing, but who's going to betray him? They themselves are continuing to betray what Jesus has taught them, which is to serve one another, to humble themselves before one another. We are guilty of this all the time that we do exactly the opposite of what Jesus has called us to do. So it says it here in the passage in verse 24, a dispute also arose among them as to which of them was to be regarded as the greatest. Now get it in the context. This is when Jesus says, woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed, even though I'm going to fulfill what I'm called to do by being betrayed. Woe to the man who does it. Their response, they begin to question one another, wait, which of us is going to, who's going to betray him? And then someone says, oh yeah, well, I, it's not me because I'm the greatest among the apostles. That's their response to start betraying the very things that Jesus has taught them are important. In an argument about which of them is going to betray Jesus, they all begin to argue in such a way that they are all betraying what Jesus has taught them to do. So this dispute rises, which will be regarded as the greatest, and Jesus immediately addresses it. He says to them, hey, the kings of the Gentiles 
exercise lordship over the Gentiles, and those in authority over them are called benefactors. But not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become as the youngest, and the leader as the one who serves. For who's the greater? The one who reclines at table or the one who serves? Isn't it the one who reclines at table? But who's serving tonight? Am I not? I am among you as the one who serves. Do you, you guys, you need to begin. remember me. This is what he told them when he gave them the bread and he gave them the cup. He said, do this in remembrance of me. And they begin to argue about which of them is going to be the greatest. And he says to them again, remember me? Me? Remember, I was the one who was serving you. I'm the one you're supposed to be like, and you're still not doing it. And then he says this. So you get the idea already. We're starting to see the passage lead in this direction that says, yeah, obviously we know there's a huge difference between Judas and his evil and Peter and John and his other friend and their loyalty. But it's not so obvious in the way they're living out their lives, even in Jesus' immediate presence. Right? We can already see the lines are being blurred. And so what Jesus says next is this in verse 20. It's a really important, this is central to the passage. This is the real core of the passage. And I, I may not come back to it because we're trying to keep this one short, but I just want you to get the idea. In verse 28, you are those who have stayed with me in my trials. And I assign to you as my father assigned to me. He says this after he corrects them, rebukes them for arguing about who's going to be the greatest. He doesn't say, you're all out of here. I'm going to start over again with a different group. He says, no, you are those who have stayed with me in my trials. And I assign to you as my father assigned to me a kingdom so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. He's actually giving them authority in the end because he is going to be faithful to them. And this fits perfectly with the kind of thing Paul mentions to Timothy, for instance, in 2 Timothy, when he says, if we suffer with him, we shall also reign with him. He says, you are those who stayed with me in my trials. But notice that he doesn't say, and because you hung in there, uh, you'll win because you have this great power that others don't have. He doesn't say that. He says, I assign to you, as my father assigned to me, a kingdom so that you can eat and drink with me at my table and so on in the kingdom. And if you think I'm exaggerating the significance of this, that it comes entirely from Jesus, just wait for the next few verses. Verse 31. We are a lot more dependent on him than we realize. And here's how it shows out in verse 31. Remember how we began the passage, verse 3? Satan entered into Judas, and he prepared to betray Jesus. All right, verse 31. Simon. So who's the greatest among the disciples? Peter, Simon. That's this man. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you so that he might sift you like wheat. Suddenly, Satan is not only active working toward Judas, but he's doing the same thing towards Peter. Hey, Simon, Satan is working on you the same way he's working on Judas. And of course, you're going to say the same thing that Peter says here. Oh, no, 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 it's not the same. It says Satan desired to have Peter, but he, but he doesn't have him. Of course, that's a part of the picture, but it's the wrong part of the picture. Because when Peter objects, how does the conversation end? With Jesus saying, hey, it's all fine. No, no, no. Jesus says that right away. But the end of the conversation is Peter saying, oh, you don't have to worry about me. I'm as faithful as your best dog, Jesus. I'll be there no matter what. And Jesus saying to him, yeah, you think so. Wait till dawn, buddy you'll see just how strong you are. <laughs> it's not going to be good. So here, here's how it says it in the passage. Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you so that he could sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. What's the difference between Peter and Judas? Look, I believe in free will. I am not a Calvinist. You can say whatever you want to in response to it. I'm just reading you the passage. What's the difference between Peter and and Judas. It's not Satan's desire. It's not Satan's work. It's not even something strong about Peter because Peter's going to fail by the time we finish reading this. It is Jesus saying, I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, when you have come back around, he hasn't even told him where he's going to be gone to. 
He just says, when you have come back again, when you've turned again, strengthen your brothers. Not take your rightful place, you know, as the greatest among the disciples, because the greatest is the one who serves, and that's what he's supposed to do, strengthen his brothers. And Peter says to him, <laughs> you don't, I don't have to return from anything. I'm ready to do it now. Lord, I'm ready to go with you to prison and to death. I remember what it means. I am willing to lay down my life. I'm willing for my body to be broken. I'm willing for my blood to be shed. I'm ready, Jesus, because I'm not like that stinky Judas. He doesn't know who it is. They don't know who it is, but he knows somebody's going to betray Jesus, and this is that very same conversation. So what Peter is saying is, I'm not like the evil one. I'm the good one. I'm the one who prepared for the communion. And Jesus says, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me. Three times denying that you that you even know me. Three times he'll deny Jesus. That, look, the, the point is pretty simple, and Luke writes it so you can't miss it. Satan enters Judas, and he desires to enter Peter, And the only difference between the two is Jesus' prayer for Peter and his faith not to fail in the end, because he's certainly not faithful when he's denying that he even knows Jesus three times before dawn. The difference is so minuscule. I mean, it's enormous because it's Jesus who prays for him and preserves him. But the difference in the character of Peter and Judas the difference in the temptation that faces them, the difference in the quality of their soul, in whatever you want to say. There's not a hair's breadth difference between us if we were as good as Peter, and that would be a stretch. But let's just say we're as good as Peter. We're like the best disciple there was, right? There's not a hair's breadth of difference between us and Judas. If we want to grasp what it means to be a peacemaker, we would understand how much Jesus did to protect us and save us when we're looking at those who are across the chasm on the side of evil. And I'm not pretending that evil's not real. I'm not pretending people don't do horrible things. But we would look all the way across the chasm and we would see that they are exactly like us. And I don't mean in our distant past. I mean in our day-to-day dependence on the intervention of Jesus to make us different. That's what we rely on. That should give us a humble perspective in our relationship with others and our desire to bridge the chasm between not just us and them, but between Jesus and us and them. Thanks for joining us for Coffee with Creamer. Your cup of coffee may be finished, but we are not. (laughs) Come back next week for a refill as we sit down to examine a new set of ideas and cultural issues. Don't miss an episode. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts or visit our website at barrycreamer.com. Until next time, keep your mug hot and your mind sharp.